The story of Titanic and her sinking is really like no other. It's why it's held the world's imagination for over 110 years. But it isn't just about a single ocean liner that struck an iceberg and sank. It's really a story that has its origins decades before Titanic was even built, and it links dozens of ships together. Today, to believe a ship could ever be unsinkable is, rightly thought, ridiculous. We have, for example, Titanic to point to as evidence, right? So just how could anyone ever have been ignorant enough to claim that a ship made of steel was unsinkable? Well, Titanic was hardly the first ship to be claimed to be practically unsinkable at all. The truth is that for an entire generation of shipbuilders, the idea of the unsinkable ship wasn't so silly as it sounds now. She was just one in a long line of impressive vessels that leveraged new and untested technology, all of it culminating in the mistaken belief that mankind had at last dominated the ocean and created a ship that could never be lost. And yet, Titanic was. But the idea of the unsinkable ship didn't actually die with Titanic. Owners and builders continued to pursue the unsinkable ship concept. But events would soon show that it was an impossible dream, and the lessons learned the hard way continue to impact how ships are designed and built to this day. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs, and this is the story of the unsinkable ship and how the dream died. To understand where the idea of an unsinkable ship even came from, we need to turn our minds back to the time before the big steel-hulled ocean liners when sailing ships were the only way to cross. Travelling across the ocean was a very dangerous proposition. Journeys could take months, so ships were exposed to the brutal weather elements of the world's oceans for days and weeks at end. Ships were constructed of wood and then eventually iron, and they were powered by sail. They were absolutely at the mercy of the elements. Thanks to the relatively small size of ships at the time, quarters were tightly packed and living conditions were horrible, so much so that the onboard spread of disease was a very common occurrence. Frankly, dying at sea or being shipwrecked wasn't just a possibility, it was likely. It was a brutal time, we've talked about this actually quite a lot on the channel before. One of my favourite examples to point to is the Lock Line. Their fleet of 25 then modern sailing ships was absolutely decimated. 11 were wrecked outright. A handful were lost in the First World War, and five just simply vanished at sea with all hands. The migrant ship Marco Polo ran a record-setting voyage out to Australia that was celebrated as a huge success, never mind that over 50 children had died of illness on the way over. This is just the way things were back then, and it's the way they'd been for hundreds of years. So with the history of life at sea in mind, try to imagine the reaction of people catching their first sight of a modern ocean liner. Wood and iron had given way to steel, increasing their size and their safety exponentially. They were powered by steam engines instead of sail, reducing voyage times from months down to just days. The big superliners started to appear right at the dawn of the 20th century. The first is often thought of as the Kaiser Wilhelm de Grosse from 1897. Spanning around 627 feet, or 191 metres long, at around 14,000 gross registered tonnes, she was absolutely the pride of the North German Lloyd Shipping Company. At the time, she was by far the largest ship in the world and the first to boast four tall funnels, which became a symbol of speed, power, and safety at sea. With the Kaiser Wilhelm de Grosser in service, the race to build safer and more advanced ships was well and truly on. But the truth was that the travelling public at last began to be reassured that after centuries of disaster and calamity at sea, ocean travel was actually a safe thing to do. Now, it all came down to a design philosophy that builders had begun to put into practice. The ship itself is a lifeboat. Let me explain exactly what that means. If one of the new modern superliners did get into trouble on her voyage, new construction features like watertight doors, bulkheads, strong building materials, and the watertight compartments would keep the ship afloat, even if she was no longer capable of powering herself, she would in theory remain safe. See, before the big steel liners of the 19th century, most ships didn't actually have any kind of watertight subdivisioning. If any part of the hull was opened up to the ocean, and it could just simply surge in and flood and sink the ship in minutes. But then designers and builders began to change things. Liners, like the city of New York, boasted a double bottom, a second inner skin of steel that extended above the keel at the very bottom of the ship. 
In theory, this would prevent the hull from being breached by rocks or anything directly from below. Compartmentalizing ships, that is, splitting them up into segments with giant interior steel walls that water couldn't flow through, became the norm as well, and shipping companies began to boast about how many watertight compartments could be flooded before their ship might hypothetically sink. Now, it was all meant to reassure the public that ocean travel was safe, and then there came a huge step forward thanks to the wireless telegraph. Ships could finally send out a distress signal using the newly adopted Marconi technology from the ship's wireless room. And since ships travelled along the same routes, effectively splitting the North Atlantic Ocean into a kind of giant highway, the idea was that should disaster ever happen, then at least a few ships would be able to get within rescue distance if they could hear the distress calls and they'd come to the aid of the damaged ship. When the rescue vessels arrived, the lifeboats could be used to simply transport passengers off of the damaged or doomed liner and ferry them over to their rescuers. Now, this was one reason why ships weren't required to carry enough lifeboats for every passenger on board. They were really just there to act as tenders, not as the final evacuation vessel. But if it sounds goofy now, well, believe it or not, practical experience showed that at the time, the theory might have had merit. In 1909, the White Star Line's RMS Republic was damaged in a collision and began to sink. But sure enough, a handful of rescue ships arrived on station to lend a hand, thanks to the Marconi wireless distress calls, and all the passengers and crew were taken off safely in time for the liner to sink. It proved, or at least it seemed to, that a ship could be built well enough that it would take hours to sink, and in that time, rescuers could come along and do their thing. But the main takeaway for builders was that with the technology improving all the time, it actually seemed feasible you could design a ship well enough that it just couldn't sink at all. Here's how they did it. First, designers turned their attention to the kinds of damage and destruction ships had faced in the past. Now, most common was grounding damage. Things like reefs, rocks, or exposed wrecks. Anything that would damage the ship from directly below and rip into the plating. This was countered by the double bottom. Then there were collisions. Republic had been rammed. So had dozens of ships before. If a liner was hit by another vessel in the same way they had been dozens of times before, then a watertight system could contain the damage because the ships that are ramming them are only so wide. It means that the ramming ship, say, would only be around 60 or 70 feet wide, so it could only damage a 60 or 70 foot long section of the liner's hull. Now, if you erected watertight bulkheads inside, then it meant only one or two of the compartments would be breached in the collision and the ship could stay afloat. In a head-on collision, the ship's bow would crumple up, but the water would be kept out entirely by all the bulkheads running aft behind towards the stern. By the time Titanic had come along in 1912, all these systems had been perfected. Titanic could survive grounding damage. In fact, the SS city of Paris had run aground, but her double bottom had basically saved her. Then there were Titanic's watertight compartments. They weren't capped at the top, but in theory, they didn't need to be. Titanic was designed to survive the kinds of damage that had happened in the past. After all, collisions with other ships were the main danger. And sure enough, there came a demonstration that Titanic could survive this too, when her sister, Olympic, was rammed by the cruiser Hawk in 1911, but she stayed well and truly afloat. The system seemed to work. Titanic was supposed to be a lifeboat all on her own. After all, there was nothing out there conceivably that could open up four, five, six or more compartments in one hit. It had just never happened before. And then, even if something totally out of the ordinary happened, then Titanic might sink, sure, but it would take hours and hours, and just like Republic had, rescue would arrive long before the ship would go beneath. Well, as we all know, this theory was nice and all, but it totally failed in practice. Shipbuilders and regulators, passengers alike, they couldn't fathom a situation in which the damage would be so severe that the idea of the ship itself as a lifeboat could fail. The Titanic disaster completely decimated the concept. Titanic suffered a glancing blow, the kind of impact that saw the iceberg drag bodily along her hull for a length of three or four hundred feet, opening a whole series of compartments up to the water. She was never designed for this scenario because it hadn't really happened before. So the worst had happened and Titanic began to sink, but just as she was designed to, she did so very slowly. The Marconi Telegraph did its thing and it got in touch with a handful of rescue ships that were in the vicinity but some were cut off by the very ice field that Titanic had run into. It acted like a kind of giant fence, preventing those nearby from getting to her in time. Carpathia was close by, but still not close enough to get there in time. 
the chink in the armor, the Achilles heel of the entire plan had been exposed in the most dramatic way possible. But shockingly, even though Titanic was lost, the idea of an unsinkable ship was not lost with her. Instead, designers decided to learn a few lessons and implement them on the next generation of ocean liner to create what they hoped would be a truly unsinkable ship. We'll get it right this time, they thought. Generally, it was thought at the time that what Titanic had suffered was a kind of freak occurrence, and that all the modern safety features should keep a ship afloat in any kind of other scenario. But then, just two years later, came the Empress of Ireland disaster. She had 11 watertight compartments herself, and could stay afloat with up to two of them flooded. But it's important to note that the watertight doors between those compartments had to be shut manually. The bulkheads on the Empress of Ireland extended all the way up from a double bottom up through the shelter deck, which was an entire three decks above the waterline. But despite all her safety features, her well-drilled crew and her full complement of boats, the inevitability of nature would once again win against the power of mankind. Sailing in a thick fog on the morning of May 29th, 1914, the Empress of Ireland collided with the SS Storstad. Now this incident left a massive hole in her starboard side, and she began to take on an immense amount of water almost instantly. There was no time to close the watertight doors, and the ship was lost in just 14 minutes, taking hundreds of lives. A key issue was that the engine room's watertight compartments, those of the boiler rooms, were way too big, and the margin of buoyancy, once those were flooded, was very slim. The Empress of Ireland belonged to the generation of ocean liner from before Titanic, but her loss demonstrated once again that a truly unsinkable ship needed to be designed for any contingency. Designers went to the drawing board and started to draft their plans. Titanic's sister, Britannic, had her construction delayed so that changes could be made and the true unsinkable ship could be built. But even while that was happening, there came a terrifying example of just what modern weapons could do to the unsinkable ship of the Edwardian age. On May 7th, 1915, the Lusitania sank at a shocking pace after having been hit by a German torpedo. In spite of all her watertight compartments, the doors and the double bottom, the subdivisioning, she was lost in just 18 minutes, and when she'd been designed to sink, if ever, over the course of hours. So why did she sink so fast despite all the efforts to make her float in any conceivable accident? Well, for one, there were her longitudinal bulkheads. These ran the length of the ship, parallel to the hull itself. The vacant space inside was used as coal bunkers along the ship's side, but it allowed flooding water to concentrate purely on her starboard side, so that as two of her forward bunkers flooded, the ship listed further over, rendering most of her lifeboats unlaunchable. Now, crucially, as Lusitania sank, her propellers were still driving ahead, and she had momentum on her. With the propellers still churning in the water, Lusitania was being propelled further forward as she sank, the forward momentum forcing water into the hull at an even faster rate, and overwhelming her compartmentalization with speed. She was actually hit between the first and second funnel, right at a spot on one of her watertight bulkheads, separating two of her boiler rooms. Like the Empress of Ireland, the rooms were huge, and it meant that a full quarter of the ship's hull was suddenly open to the ocean. With one hit, the complex subdivisioning system was found not just to be hopeless, but also in and of itself dangerous because the bunkers had threatened to throw Lusitania onto her beam ends, and she'd ended up at 15 degrees over, and it had stopped the safe loading of boats. Clearly, designers had much more to consider when designing the unsinkable ship than they'd first thought, but by late 1915, possibly the closest thing designers would ever get to an unsinkable ship, was ready. She was Britannic, Titanic's sister. The delay in construction had allowed for substantial changes to her design. In addition to a double bottom like Titanic had, Britannic had a double skin hull around the engine room and the boiler room areas of the ship, meaning she'd probably have survived the kind of scrape with an iceberg Titanic had. Her bulkheads extended all the way up as high as B deck, whereas on Titanic they'd only reached E deck three decks below and then only just above the waterline. Of course, she carried more than enough lifeboats for everyone on board, but she also introduced improved davits, the enormous crane-like gantry davits so that the ship could launch all her lifeboats, even if she was taking on a list as severe as the Lusitania had. At last, it seemed, a liner had been built that could survive the worst of what could possibly be thrown at it. She'd be able to survive a collision, or a grounding, a side-scraping iceberg, and even a torpedo hit, the likes of which Lusitania had suffered because Britannic didn't have the longitudinal bulkheads and her watertight compartments were comparatively smaller. If she was holed then, in theory, she would sink slowly and evenly, and the Davits would be able to get all the boats away. This was it. 
the unsinkable ship. Or so her designers thought. Like so many before her, Britannic could not escape the laws of nature and the pitfalls of chance. On November 21st, 1916, operating as a hospital ship, Britannic hit a German mine. The explosion from a single mine blast should not have been severe enough to sink the mighty Britannic because she'd been designed to survive this very kind of impact, but fate was not, that day, on Britannic's side. The mine explosion was a short, sharp jolt that knocked Britannic's hull so suddenly that the watertight doors in the area around the blast couldn't be closed at all, and those further down couldn't be shut all the way. The impact had simply knocked the rails that the doors ran down out of true, ever so slightly, and the full force of tons of German explosives had blown clean through the double hull and flooded the ship. Britannic was doomed, but she ended up sinking way quicker than she had been designed to. Her captain had decided on a last minute dash for the shore to beach the ship, possibly forcing more water in as she went along and hastening her demise, but the real cause of the ship's sudden loss were her hundreds of portholes. Because she was in service as a hospital ship, many of these were purposely left open to air out her wards before picking up more wounded soldiers. It was actually against the rules, but ships like Britannic had never been designed to operate in the Mediterranean, and the interiors must have been shockingly stuffy. With dozens of big portholes open all the way along her hull, her sinking simply sped up exponentially as more of her hull was exposed to the surface of the ocean with her crew totally unable to stop all the flooding Britannic sank in just 55 minutes. Now, she was designed to survive the very incident that had sunk Titanic, but was lost in well under half the time Titanic had taken to sink. It had been a valiant effort still, and the damage would probably have sunk older ships in just a few minutes, but Britannic had done what her designers had hoped for, and stayed afloat long enough for the boats to be launched safely by those huge gantry davits. But she had still sunk and with her had gone any thought of making a ship unsinkable. That's not to say designers just gave up. To this day, big passenger ships are built with watertight compartments and double bottoms, just like liners from Titanic's day were, but more thought goes into what would happen if the system should fail and the ship should sink. For example, many modern cruise ships are designed as two compartment ships, that they should be able to stay afloat with any two main compartments flooded, and then if that were to happen, thought is actually put into how the ship would behave that the list could not exceed 15 degrees, so that all the lifeboats can actually get away safely. Where technology has improved monumentally is in the navigational equipment and detection. Now, thanks to ship's radar installations, threats like icebergs can be seen from miles away. In fact, modern passenger ship radar can pick up an iceberg up to 5 miles or 8 kilometers away, or even more. That and icebergs tracked by the International Ice Patrol. Their paths are recorded and regularly shared digitally with passenger ships on the North Atlantic. The world's oceans are even busier nowadays, and the sea lanes are full of container ships and tankers of all sorts, so the theory still goes that any ship in serious danger could have all its passengers rescued in time. But never again will designers construct a ship to be its own lifeboat, completely confident of the idea that it could never sink. We've learned too many lessons the hard way too many times to know that it's just not the case. In less than two decades, the world saw both the launch of the first superliners and then the complete shattering of the idea of the unsinkable ship. So many examples of the safest ships of their time are now at the bottom of the ocean, along with hundreds of their passengers. Perhaps it's easy for people today to look back at the idea of the unsinkable ship and judge those that thought something like that could ever be possible. We can call them ignorant or naive, we can point out that anything is sinkable under the right conditions, and we would be right. Maybe we just live in a more sceptical time, but hundreds of years of history has shown us that any ship can sink, any plane can crash, any building can fall. Maybe people today are conditioned to see a fatal flaw in anything. But instead of judging, maybe we can reflect on those short few years when people really believed that humanity had transcended all that. In this era of almost pure naive optimism, our massive technological strides had tricked us into thinking that we were above nature, that we'd tamed the ocean. And it was a harsh lesson to learn that it wasn't true at all. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Oceanliner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel because we get new videos out weekly. If you want to support my work and get really cool perks like behind the scenes and early access, please visit my Patreon in the link in the description below or sign up as a YouTube member. Come and join the crew. And as always, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time.